Um, you know, I'm going to sit on this panel and give like a publisher perspective. We have you know, uh, brand owners and clients and media agencies. Uh, yeah, so I, you know, from a content perspective, that's what we do for a living. We're a content factory. Times Network uh, produces content for a bunch of television channels as well as a large digital platform. And uh, you know, from, from the perspective which we are looking at this business is, it's, it's really turning you know, the tide right now. It's becoming probably, like Anita said, the biggest pillar in uh, you know, our monetization opportunity because, uh, uh, for instance, on, on digital, you know, over many years, primarily the, the revenue line was on banners and you know, you know, takeovers and high impact uh, uh, pieces and video pre-rolls, etc. But that's all got commoditized really fast. And you know, as the clients and agencies are moving and shifting dollars onto branded content, publishing ecosystems are also evolving on the same in the same direction. So now, our biggest opportunities to monetize and where our focus area for publishers are is on you know branded content on one hand and programmatic revenue on the other. So it's good to be a part of this panel. As this progresses, we'll talk a little bit more on you know how this works for a publisher or a content owner. Hey, hi everyone. So look, I'll just go back to uh, the sales part that you brought about. And uh, I believe content has two roles to play. So A, the content needs to be entertaining. B, the content needs to be useful. And C, if you can do both, wow. Uh, at the end of the day, one needs to look at content from what is the objective that you have in mind. So, you know, if you look at the entire funnel, and let me break this funnel into three parts. So there's a top of the funnel that most brands go for. If the idea here is to drive simple engagement, if the idea here is to drive brand awareness, drive brand building, there is a certain way in which you need to look at content and also this, there is a certain way in you need to look at the matrices. If you look at the middle of the funnel, which is where you push somebody down from top of the funnel into a more considered, more aware state, mm -hmm. then again, you know, here is where the role of explainer type of content comes in, how to, what do I do, how does it work and so on. And again, the matrix for these would be different from what they would be at the top of the funnel. And as you go down to sales, which is really where the rubber meets the road, uh, you know, you look at very hardcore content, which is really an offer that if you apply, you get X, or you know, content which really makes you apply for a certain product or services. And here, you know, you would look at conversions or whatever is your associated matrix to look how this entire content, uh, you know, kind of sort of uh, works. And again, uh, the whole point I'm trying to drive is, is that depending on what objective you have, and you could have a full funnel objective, you need to choose and be careful about the content that you produce and you create and whom you work with, and we'll discuss more on that. But also you need to be careful in terms of what you're measuring. So what could be very useful at the top of the funnel might mean very little when you're talking at the bottom of the funnel. At the end of the you know, day, it's, it's really how you move the needle. How does the sales number move? Did it help you sell more? Did it drive spends? Did it drive acquisition? I think if it did, the content was useful, the content was entertaining, and if it did not, then uh, you know the content was just good to have, and, and we'll talk more about that. Um, hi guys, uh, super excited to be here at AppTech. Thank you so much for having us here. Um, so let me just go back to Liz's questions, uh, which is basically saying, does content drive sales? And the reason why we're asking this question um, I think it's because fundamentally we're not sure like is this just good to do is it does it actually lead to hard numbers and um, I'd step back uh, consumers buy products uh, or consumers buy brands uh, that they believe in or that they trust um, and therefore as a marketer as a brand custodian my biggest challenge is to be able to build trust with consumers 10 years back I could have built that trust by pure traditional advertising today I can't do that uh, given the context of content that exists, uh, consumers are not willing to trust pure traditional advertising like they did a decade back. And therefore, pretty much, it's important for me as a marketer to actually build trust with a consumer. For me to build that trust, I need to have branded content. I should talk to consumers about things that they want to talk about, things that shape their narratives, things that shape culture. Um, and once you've built trust, uh, and your product has relevance, uh, your brand is going to be the brand that the consumer chooses. So um, as a brand custodian, um, I do believe that um, branded content is as important, if not more, uh, for sales as is traditional advertising. Um, 
good, nice perspectives, um, expanding horizons for everyone. Uh, my second question is, how is your branded content performing against key brand metrics and allowing you to determine ROI? I think we'll first ask Nikhil and Sakshi uh, and then um, uh, uh, Shonil to go uh, before Anita will tell us about more brands than one. So we will go to one, the single brand custodians first. So Nikhil, maybe you can start. Yeah, thanks. I think it's quite related to the first one that we just discussed. And this is... Uh, this is the holy grail, guys. I mean, this is quite difficult to track at, at most times, and I'll be honest to admit that. But but I do believe as a marketer that branded content definitely drives ROI. And and now I will you know let's let's get into more specifics on this. So we discussed about let's say if there is a new product or service that I want to build awareness about, or I want to engage a certain set of consumers. Now, what is the type of content I create there? Who are the kind of people I work with to create that content? Is it really, uh, is it based on insight? Is it is it authentic? And does this have the ability to engage people? If it does, then then what I will probably do is that, you know, I will get into more specific matrices to measure that, you know, how many people interacted with that piece of content, how many people liked it, how many people shared it, what is the time spent and so on and so forth. Uh, today there is analytics that allows us to go after these consumers in a repeated way. We can, we can build an audience of these people. We know then who are the kind of people who really like us and therefore these are the kind of people that we should go after. We can create lookalike of these kind of people that again that you know s similar audience or audience who looks like this can be another way to expand your funnel. And as you do that, you know the idea uh, from an ROI point of view is always to continue to push people from top of the funnel to bottom of the funnel. But what I've seen uh, over the years in my experience with City and other brands that uh, you know this is really the first stage where you get a chance to interact with the, with the consumer and with the advent of social and digital, I think this is a great opportunity for brands to, to authentically engage with their consumers, to, to have a two-way dialogue, to truly understand what, what is meaningful to them, what is important to them and therefore shape how brands talk to consumers, shape how they personalize their offerings, shape how they, they go about their offers and, and it's quite easy therefore to track that what you did on top of the funnel in terms of branded content, uh, you know, how did it really move the needle and what is the return that you're getting on this kind of spend. Yeah, I actually agree with uh, Nikhil's perspective. So fundamentally a lot of brand campaigns or marketing campaigns that we would do would have multiple metrics that we want to move. Um, and like uh, Anita said, it's very important that you create the right kind of content uh, versus just creating any content uh, and also content that adds back to what your brand stands for. Um, let me give you an example um, of a recent branded content campaign that we did at Uber. Um, so um, Uber is a brand stands for um, a core essence about the fact that movement ignites opportunity. As a brand, we help unlock a lot of people to move forward in life. Um, and we believe that movement and opportunity should exist equally for all. Um, and we got into um, a partnership with the ICC Women's World Cup um, a couple of weeks back, uh, fundamentally because cricket has fundamentally been a gentleman's sport, right? It's been a men play cricket. Um, and here there are a bunch of women who are actually going out there and changing the way the sport is and they're actually moving the sport forward and we got into uh, really a branded content strategy for uh, for the World Cup and what we actually kicked off was a campaign with said Jersey Knows No Gender. Um, it was a campaign which spoke about the brand philosophy of um, moving people forward, a philosophy of people breaking stereotypes. Um, all of which was very core to Uber as a brand. Um, and if you look at the content that got created, the content that got generated, um, it was not about, it was not traditional advertising. It was not about us pushing down a product, pushing down a particular offer. It was about talking to people, having conversations about things that mattered to them. Um, we, we saw a huge organic traction. We saw the likes of Virat Kohli, uh, who's our brand ambassador, but we saw the Indian uh, uh, Mithali Raj. Uh, a lot of cricketers actually came up and supported the women moving forward. What that resulted in was a huge impact on brand favorability, a huge impact on people saying, This is the brand I trust. 
this is the brand I trust because this is the philosophy that I believe in. I believe women should be doing things that they were not doing a decade back. And as a brand, um, that's when you make a difference. That's when you actually start moving metrics because what you've done is you've enabled people to have conversations they were not having before. And that's when they start trusting you. So it goes back to my earlier point that when you have conversations with people about building trust, when they start buying into you as a brand, what it does is it does move metrics. For us, it moved favorability, it moved trust indexes, and what that will result in going forward, like Anita said, is that when it comes to choosing a brand or actually putting your dollar in, what you will choose is a brand you trust. And therefore, as a brand, we've seen it uh, truly impact metrics, uh, depending upon what metric you pick uh, for a particular activity. So, so just to sum up, I think the two brands yeah, here and uh, they've kind of made my life easier. Which is, uh, you know, it's, as they said, it's not about likes and following. You know, it's largely about engagement. Uh, and what is the kind of uh, content that a brand is putting out of the marketplace for the consumers uh, is what matters. In, in this case, as you mentioned for Uber, uh, to me, I would actually put it into the area of insp inspiring content. So there are six kinds of content uh, pillars that we uh, look at, you know. So there's entertain content that's entertaining, educating, informing, uh, helping, supporting and inspiring. So we actually, you know, have those little uh, buckets wherein we put the uh, content pieces and depending on what the brand is all about, depending on uh, the benefits of the brand to the audiences and what is the kind of content that the brand should actually be producing and uh, getting out of the marketplace which causes a lot of engagement with, this, uh, with the consumers and when it causes that engagement that you were talking about is when the trust in the brand goes up you know and when the trust in the brand goes up the brand becomes far more meaningful and then you actually end up being uh, not only an advocate of the brand you propel the brand values in the marketplace yeah and, and there are different metrics of uh, measuring the roi whether it is favorability whether it is sales whether it is trust you know and you will ultimately find that all these pointers actually culminate into one little thing which one uh, not little actually it's a big thing which is which is all to do with sales right so it's all it all leads up to conversion which becomes your ultimate matrix yeah so anyway like uh, from a publisher's perspective sitting on the other side of the fence uh, you know the brand owners uh, like nikhil and sakshi are here but our job is to deliver the content that's that's what we do for a living and uh, we're seeing this massive, massive movement on uh, you know, the, the ask for branded content. It's complicated for us because you know, uh, on one hand, especially being a news publisher, our content has to be extremely focused and you know, honest to itself. And you know, we have the, the entire challenges uh, you know, of our newsroom delivering uh, objective news. Uh, it's a little early days, but I think we're all getting the hang of how to do branded content right. Uh, we have large teams which kind of uh, work with uh, brand owners, and these are interesting projects because you actually have to get into it, into a you know very detailed discussion, early stage discussion, understand all the aspirations and objectives of that brand and that you know that campaign duration, and deliver out. And it's these are true partnerships, unlike where brands come and buy inventory on our sites and and uh, you know uh, uh, run their commercial inventory with us. These are engagements where you know which are exciting, which are pretty much projects ground up, and uh, uh, the objective eventually is to deliver on all the metrics the the brand lays out. And well thought out planning and you know a serious engagement and a close engagement with brands results in the best results on all the metrics which you guys spoke about. Um, this. Uh me too. I think some of it is covered, but we'll still uh, talk about this. Brands have objectives. Some brands define it as some people are in the stage of creating awareness, some are in salience, some want to be top of mind. Um, uh, so, which any what are the what are the views in the panel on uh, which part of the journey is actually content equipped to do? Will you actually miss? content in your marketing plan if you skip it one year or don't do it at all? Uh, is it very, uh, is it opportunity based in that sense and you may do it if you find an opportunity? Is it a discretionary part of your, uh, you know, of your overall plan to meet brand objectives or is it an imperative? How do you all see it? Um, uh, who wants to go? 
<laughs> you you want to go first? <laughs> Uber. <laughs> okay, um, I actually, um, I, I think I've made it pretty clear. I'm a pretty strong believer in uh, branded content. But I, um, I actually think uh, for a marketer of today, um, I don't think you can risk not having branded content as part of your marketing strategy. It's essential. Um, I, um, in fact, Forbes did a study a couple of years back which said that most consumers actually do not believe that traditional advertising is fact-based. As all of us as marketers, we do know that all marketing activities are fact-based. Uh, but most consumers actually don't. Uh, and therefore, in order to communicate effectively with consumers today who actually have access to so much content, uh, I think it's a very important part of the entire journey. And let me talk about a couple of uh, metrics that we track as traditional marketers. Talk about reach, right? Um, and 10 years back, it was very easy to say, OK, I'm going to, this is the reach. This is the number of consumers I want to reach out to. This is my ad. Here's the money. Go get it. Uh, fundamentally, the big difference is today that the, the power of organic reach that exists with branded content does not exist with traditional advertising. And therefore, it's very important for you to have branded content that consumers want to share. Uh, everything that I share on my handle, myself, um, has a higher degree of endorsement, higher degree of trust that I talk about uh, with the brand. And therefore, I think uh, the power of branded content there is much higher. Um, uh, like Anita and uh, Shanil were talking about, also the engagement levels are much higher. When you go through the route of uh, a publisher, when you're talking about content which is going out, you have a much more engaged audience with you. Uh, these are people who actually are seeking content. They want to know about this particular piece of content. They will engage much more with it. And therefore, as a brand, uh, you do have exposure through branded content to consumers who are more receptive uh, than consumers who would be of pure play traditional marketing. Uh, and of course, I can't um, um, not go back to trust. Uh, consumers who consume branded content um, trust you a lot more because they're buying into the content that you're talking about, the uh, pretty much the point of view that you're endorsing as a brand versus the fact if there's a brand which is just selling out a piece of product. So I actually think it's a very integral part, uh, whether it's at recruiting consumers, whether it's at uh, keeping them, whether it's engaging them, or whether it's even taking them through the entire life cycle. Uh, to me, it's an integral part all through. Yeah, thanks. And, and I couldn't agree more with Sakshi. I mean, you know, content marketing is probably the most important piece of the marketing funnel that we have, even in city. And and there's a lot of work that goes in terms of, you know, like she mentioned time and again, the entire point about building trust, building endorsement in an authentic way, and then also engaging consumers, you know, who start to believe in a certain philosophy or in a certain way that you that you take a point of view on things on. And you know, user generated content and again organic sharing is something that really helps make that entire thing authentic if you strike a chord if you are in sight if you stand for something you will see people coming and expressing themselves with you and over a period of time that is what truly you know binds or links back a consumer to a brand uh, i'll go a step further from here that you know there are in my opinion also the need of the hour in terms of certain functionalities uh, or the way you know our industry in, in fintech is today changing. So there are a lot of these digital functionalities, so to say, which needs true help in terms of content. A pure play advertisement is not really going to tell a consumer how to transfer funds. You need a certain type of content to tell somebody that, look, hey, this is the way you need to do it. And these are the five steps you need to follow. That's also a branded piece of content. Probably it's, it's somewhere middle or lower in the funnel. It's not truly about driving awareness and engagement. But unless you tell somebody how it's done, he or she will not be able to do it. And as we are moving towards more, or more and more you know, self-help type of products, where consumers want to take control, they want to talk to the RM through a video chat, they want to transfer funds any time of the day, they want to add a nominee, lots of you know, uh, small, small things that need explanation for the first time. Again, probably content marketing is the only way to tell people how to do it. Again, in an interesting way, in an engaging way, in an inspiring way. But fundamentally, you need to tell people what to do. And it's quite trackable. Therefore, we all love it because 
you know, you promote a certain, certain functionality or a certain way of doing things, you can see the impact in terms of how that, that feature has picked up or who's, how many of your consumer base is consuming it or how has it helped to acquire new, new clients or new customers. So it's a very, very important piece uh, and it goes without saying that uh, I believe there is no marketing possible in today's world, uh, you know, if you don't have content marketing. Rest, everything comes around the core content that you create in today's time. No, yeah, that's super testimonials to hear, you know, from big brands here in India. But we're seeing a lot of this. And, uh, you know, if I can take a, it a step further, we, are, we as publishers are also very, very quickly evolving. And we, we're, we're going to bet, if we had $10 to bet right now, we would bet it on branded content. Because that's where the spends are coming in our direction. Contest, content is something we know and we do well. We have massive reach and huge platforms. But they are useless without great content. So we're finding the right ways to mix and match and, and bring brands into the, into the mix, do high quality you know, video content, social outreach, uh, you know, put all the pieces together and kind of make a complete one-stop solution. But like Nikhil rightly said, the starting point and the main you know, key uh, component here is, is the content which is created. And it has to be done uh, you know, in the right, right fashion. There's a whole lot of you know, uh, important elements there. And uh, it's evolving, but it's growing super fast. Yeah, I mean, couldn't agree less, actually. I think we are all on the same page. Uh, content and branded content, of course, is becoming increasingly important. And it's, it's a very, very big pillar in the entire ma marketing uh, communications uh, bit. Uh, you know, uh, interestingly, uh, you find that depending on what your objective is, really, is the kind of content that you're pushing out into the marketplace. For example, Nikhil was just giving an example of a transfer. You know, what are you doing there? You're actually trying to put out content which is very, very uh, either educative or informative. You know, telling the consumer as to how to go about uh, making a fund uh, transfer. So it's very important to match the kind of content that you're putting out in the marketplace with the objective uh, that you would have. See, the, the way the communication is happening today, things are really changing. No longer brands are, you know, consumers are wanting to listen to brands. It's not one-sided. It's all about storytelling. And I think when you do storytelling uh, for, for a brand, it beautifully, the branded content piece beautifully gets weaved in. You know, and then comes the engagement part with the consumers. So when brands are doing the storytelling, you are actually engaging with the audiences. You are you are take, picking up one leg or the other. For example, in India, rewarding content is extremely important. So the 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 guy, the consumers out there, they are looking at content which is rewarding, content which is inspiring, and content uh, you know which which for example uh, is is in the area of uh, education uh, or information and stuff like that. You know, we look at the travel industry for example, there people. People are looking at content which actually inspires them, you know, much before that they get informed about it. So they're looking at, you know, destinations which are very inspiring, pictures here and there or videos here and there. Vis-a-vis -vis an automobile sector, you know, where actually consumers are looking at, at content because they know a lot about automobiles, they compare a lot online about automobiles, they would want a very entertaining content to be, uh, you know, fed to them. So it completely depends on what your objective is and what is the kind of content and that's where your engagement is going to be maximum. Um, I think this one we'll start with uh, both Sunil and Anita. What would you do differently to support branded content to optimize its ROI? Is, are there any, uh, are we missing a trick or uh, could you give us a few, uh, your insights? See, uh, the way we look at it, there are three, three key parameters for branded content to really uh, move in the direction of ROI. Now all content, because it is content and because it is not Excel sheets, right? is there is a different ROI matrix that you put to it. But what we feel is interestingly that association, uh, performance, and expectation, these are the three parameters which are very important. Association in terms of how, as a brand, you are associating the content that engages uh, the audiences. How, as an audience, I would expect uh, you know, the brand to perform and how does content lead to it and also expectations of the audiences as to, oh, you know, the audience was expecting, for example, you're launching a, a, a new a credit card and the audience is expecting a lot of information uh, you know, on the credit card as to what it does or what it does differently. And you're going out there and doing an event with a, with a uh, you know, with a singer and entertaining the audiences. So there is a complete mismatch. So I think association, uh, expectation and performance, to my mind, are three very, very uh, important key parameters to gauge content and then to create that kind of content. 
so from our perspective, I think the most important piece which we bring into this mix of uh, you know quality, high quality branded content is our own brand and credibility. You know because a news brand has to be credible, and large news brands. So we we see a lot of uh, you know clients and brands coming to work for us for the association which we also add in you know in terms of notional value to that campaign or for that brand. So I think there's a lot of effort on our side to maintain the high quality standards of news reporting and you know quality journalism etc and that over time when we do you know partnerships with brands and clients that translates to a lot of value in their messaging and what they're trying to achieve as well um, I think this is uh, my uh, last uh, question is that is corporate culture conducive to content uh, marketing and does it create hurdles because of its uh, of people's inability to fathom the price and uh, the return that you get on it so for example in my own experience at um, at the bank at Kotak I've heard people say ki itna karcha karna hai what will you get I mean is is how do you know the shelf life of uh, this piece is very short, but you're spending a lot of money. And the marketeer's uh, lens says that if I don't get quality, and if I don't put something good out there, then that is, uh, you know, it's a, it's it's worrying because then you won't get the right kind of engagement. So, uh, do you face that um, those questions, and uh, uh, or how do you tackle that, them? Um, okay, so. Um, at Uber, we actually do have a very nimble uh, work culture. We're quick to adapt to, to things. We're fast. Um, and therefore, I think um, I don't think the challenge is as much. Uh, but in my experience, I think that's one of the big challenges for a marketer today, which is to actually be able to convince the, the rest of the organization, largely the business, largely the operations side of the business, that this adds value. This actually goes back to the conversation that we've had. If we're able to call out or prove that there are metrics which move, um, the problem is solved. Um, to what, Liz, you started off by saying, right, that the biggest problem is, I don't know what this beast is. Like, what does it do? Does it do anything? And I think as, um, I think the biggest challenge for us as marketers is to actually help put that to rest, where you say, okay, this is what it does, these are the way it moves the metrics that we've discussed. Once that happens, uh, I think the challenge is much lesser. Uh, personally, for me at Uber, uh, the challenge is uh, much lesser. Uh, we're uh, extremely um, innovative in things we do. We're happy to try new things. Um, and uh, content marketing is one of the things that we're super excited to do a lot of. Uh, but in my mind, the biggest hurdle exists because of the ambiguity that's associated with not knowing what it does. And once we're able to bring some clarity around it as marketers, I think uh, the problem will be much lesser. I think Nikhil on. I wish my life was that simple. <laughs> <laughs> so I got uh, always a bunch of um, bankers to convince that how branded content works. But, but the great thing is that, uh, in my opinion, uh, it's quite measurable in the way uh, that you go about content. So I'll, I'll go back to the, to the thing that I've been saying, that if you truly define your objective well, then today you have KPIs to support or prove that a branded piece of content works. So for example, we talked about fund transfer a, a moment back. You can actually prove that number of people who now come to the branch and asking for fund transfers, how, have, how many of them have actually gone down? You can see the increase in fund transfers that are happening, for example, on your mobile app. You can track the reduction of calls at a contact center who are asking for directions of how to do a certain, uh, certain functionality within the mobile app. So, you know, basis that you can prove or disprove that a certain piece of content, how did this, this content performed on this objective. If the objective is acquisition and you're in a fairly engaging and exciting, let's say a travel type of content with your offers and deals bunged in, you can actually prove through usage on the card so you can track people who engage with that content. And because we, we are rich in data, uh, you know, we can see how, that, how the card transactions have moved up on travel, for example, or number of new applications that came in to apply for a certain travel card, for example. So, so as you keep refining this, there's, uh, you know, it's still evolving. Uh, so there, there are a lot of pieces which are still not tackled. Somebody could, 
interact with the piece of content and not come back to you for for some time so what is the window that you that you keep for measuring that the same consumer could have interacted with multiple pieces including the branded content that you created so do you have the right attribution model to to truly give something weightage that uh, you know that that piece truly deserves uh, that's that continues to be a challenge and then how do you prove it back that uh, this is the reason why uh, you know, a certain sale happens. So when our RMs today go and meet clients for new business, sometimes clients talk about the kind of branded content that they have consumed. And then the relationship managers will come back and say, look, look, I think it's effective. It helped me in that meeting to convince somebody to open, you know, a high value account. So, so various ways, uh, uh, one needs to clearly look at the objectives. I think in large organizations need to work a lot with business and other stakeholders to explain what you are trying to do and how you are going to measure it. Uh, come to that consensus, and I think then it's uh, relatively easier to prove the return uh, on content. But but it's both a both a piece of art and science. So uh, there's only that much you can measure. Uh, you know, you need, you still need a lot of belief. You still need a lot of inspiration to continue to do remarkable you know pieces of content that will eventually help your brand equity and your brand salience in the long term. Uh, sorry. So my two cents on this is that uh, you know branded content is coming of age. Uh, you know, marketers want to do it, but one of the stumbling blocks which you know which everyone's going through is it's not easy. Uh, you know, for instance, traditional invent you know commercial deals or inventory buys on publishers. We would you know my sales team would go to Anita's agency and you know close out a largest deal on you know F TV FCT and X amount of banners and things like that. And that was small conversations done in you know two meetings in one week these branded content conversations are long drawn out they're multiple stakeholders we probably just bypass the client completely because the agency understands you know what kind of inventory is needed to deliver the client's objectives but here there are multiple stakeholders the clients themselves want to be very closely associated with the kind of content which is getting delivered very very exciting conversations but complicated i just want to kind of the you know takeaway i want to leave with everyone is it's working I think all stakeholders have to invest more time and effort in this. There is great content, uh, you know, capabilities here with you know publishers and content creators. We just have to marry all this together, and you know, move this uh, ahead really, really quickly. But it's 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 uh, it's challenging to execute these, you know, uh, campaigns and uh, deals, but um, scaling at a good pace. I, I mean, again, agree with all of you. You guys just take it away from me each time. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, there's a paradigm shift in the way uh, communication is getting consumed by the audiences. And uh, we're not going to, you know, as an audience, I'm not going to, you know, sit down and take shit, uh, you know, from marketers just because they want me to uh, buy buy a brand uh, from their stable. So it's, it's, it's getting tough out there. There is just too much happening out there. Yeah, but as, as they rightfully said, you know, it's easier to express and explain internally to your managements that your branded content piece is working as long as you've set an objective and there is a branded content piece which is delivering to that objective. So I think their life, while I'm saying it's so simply, it's not as, as simple. But I think if you are keeping those three, four parameters in mind and working towards it, then life should be a little more simpler. Yeah. Uh, we have, I think, three minutes for questions. So, um, if anybody has one. Hello. Yeah, hi. Good afternoon, everyone. So, my name is Rishabh Madan. I am from Excite Industries Limited and I'm looking after the marketing area in my company. So my, my question is very relatable to the subject of this discussion. See, uh, let me just give you a perspective what we look after. We have divided the areas of our digital marketing into two aspects. One is conversion bit, the other is conversation. Conversion simply means a selling of our online, uh, through our online channel batteries, batteries and uh, inverters, batteries as well as inverters through our online channel. And conversion is the whole of gamut of social media platforms as well as advertising on Google and other things. While the conversion bit is easily measurable, I, it becomes very difficult to uh, explain it to our management as well as to our agencies. How do we measure them? Unless we will not be able to measure that, how do I, 
how do I optimize that campaign? That becomes a very big challenge. So this is actually a question, measuring the value of your branded content. How does one an answer that? Sh shall I uh, take that? Yeah, so I have uh, an example, and um, <clears throat> which I will give, which we did in the bank recently. So we have a product for women called Silk from uh, Kotak. And uh, Silk is a, a, a bank account for women, but it, it is a whole savings program for women. And we did a piece of, uh, <clears throat> we did a video uh, to uh, relaunch uh, Silk, and we measured two kinds of things there. We measured the opening of Silk accounts, as well as the engagement or the number of views <clears throat> and the engagement uh, rate that we got on it. So it was a bit of a hybrid model. And, and it's, it's, I, I think <clears throat> some of these models, which I have myself shown, retention, consumption, etc., they sometimes can't be done in isolation. L like many of them have said, it depends on your objective at that point in time and the kind of content you're creating, video or whether it's static or you know uh, what uh, what is really kind of format where you put it, whether you're just going to uh, you know you're going to send an email, whether you're going to do it on social, whether it's video, etc. So it, there is something about form, there is something about purpose, there is something about. Uh, all of this which you know you have to define like this was a relaunch you needed awareness you needed engagement but we also wanted accounts and we got we measured both and we got both so that's that's my example just to add to um, uh, what liz is saying is uh, i think you're also dissociating the two you cannot do that yeah because you're looking at conversion on one side online conversion you're saying it's only happening because of what you're doing digitally yeah, because the other things that you're doing also has a cumulative effect on the consumer. You know, so you cannot, while you're not defining, you should be defining it for the other, other part where you're saying that it's becoming difficult for you to measure, and here it is measurable, but that part is also having an impact on the, the online sales that you're having. And also if you were to, as she rightfully said, key in your objectives for the other part, uh, then you will be very clear about what is the contribution from this side to that side. We have one more question. We'll just yeah. take one. Hi, guys. Uh, I'm Neil from L'Oreal. Um, my one question to all of you guys, including the marketeers and agency guys, I think a lot of us which we feel is attribution to branded content. I think I think end of the day, I, Anita mentioned a lot of times that sales is the last driven goal while you're creating content. But how do you attribute content to sales is something which I think is unanswered in this panel discussion. Uh, I'll just uh, start with the same Silk example. So we had a form in the content. We had a landing page of form. So at the end of the video, there was, it took you to a place where you fill a form which you can fill and go and buy, uh, uh, open an account. So you can often integrate a very strong CTA basis, your objective, into your content, which the consumer may or may not take basis. Again, you know, it, the, the, the whole, uh, how have you designed it in a way, does it inspire the person to take the next step at the end of the content? Or sometimes there are con pieces of content where the person actually does not register the brand because it's the, the fine balance of relevance and being overbranded is something marketeers are dealing with. So it's very tricky. I think that that is that that uh, discretion is with the marketeer and the way they uh, you know can actually ac as ex assess the pulse of, of the consumer and the piece of content. But all views. So yeah, actually, I, I agree with Liz, and um, you know, I hear you uh, because for a pure FMCG consumer uh, product, it's not as easy for you to relate um, uh, content as much to sales. But um, in my experience, what you what you can do is do stuff like what Liz said, where you have a stronger call to action with your content. You have a lot of analytics now available. You have a lot of lift studies that you can do, which actually tell you what's the probability of this consumer actually going out there and buying that piece of content. It's important for you to continue doing re-engagement with that consumer, where there's this guy who's seen your content, you re-engaged with him, you actually figure out whether that resulted not today, maybe a week later, maybe a month later, uh, into a purchase. Um, and it's important for you to build that ecosystem around your digital marketing programs for you to be able to do that. It may not necessarily happen with your first piece of content. Um, and for, for example, for a lot of us, which where a lot of our uh, marketing investments, both in time, money, effort, happen online, uh, it's 
it's part of business. Uh, but for a lot of consumer good companies, that's something that um, I think needs to be built in uh, for you to be able to actually follow through the consumer journey to actually know if that translated into purchase. But there are enough tools available uh, today which will allow you to be able to track that um, in a fairly significant manner for you to be able to actually say, you know, guys, guys this works. Yeah, no, I think I think you answered it brilliantly. And and having worked in FMCG, I can understand your challenge because yours is not a straight through fulfillment on the internet. So how do you correlate back to sales? So you know, one is that, like Sakshi mentioned, you can engage and re-engage. And the beauty of doing this is that you can have separate pieces of content for each type of engagement. So somebody who's interacted with your video film, the next time you throw a piece of content to the same person and you can build cookie pools, you can build audiences, uh, you know, should, can be a little more educative. The third time it could be a different aspect or a different feature of the product. And at the on, end of the day, for FMCG, you can, you can measure a strong intention to purchase or a strong band lift. Now, how will you correlate it back to an offline sale? If the sale goes through Amazon, maybe you can use pixelation and you can, you can track that. But, but the real life is that you know, somebody will go to a retailer and do that purchase. And at that time, you know, probably you will have to engage uh, and see the differential between people who interacted with your pieces of content versus people who did not. Uh, or, in, or in separate IPs where you do this versus where you do not. And you can see the incremental value. You can use consumer surveys to measure how did they learn about your brand, what, where did they found out more about you. And this will give you a fair amount of uh, you know, confidence that what you did on the piece of branded content, that it really read it, you know, led to sales or, or you know, somebody just interacted and fell off somewhere in the middle. I just want to add to what Nicholas is saying, um, especially because of the challenges that you would face because you're a FMCG uh, product, really. Uh, consumer surveys um, are, are a good tool. I don't underestimate it. Um, when I made my transition from uh, consumer goods to uh, Uber, I remember the first thing that I was pretty surprised was that consumers actually respond uh, a lot to things that you ask them. Um, and therefore, when we go out to improve a lot of things uh, in our products, we actually reach out to our consumer base and get some really solid uh, information. Uh, and a lot of times, it's good to go back to your consumers and ask them, did you see my content? Uh, did you make a purchase? Um, you'll get a decent enough sample size to tell you whether it's working or not. Yeah, so since we're out of time, we wouldn't, would it, we wouldn't be taking any further questions, but I would uh, request all the delegates to connect with our speakers offline a little later. Thank you so much. Thank you once again for an interesting panel discussion. A huge round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you so much. With that, let's